Hello, good evening and welcome. So tonight we're getting into a new book, which I've rented from the University of Akron. Oh my goodness, I'm so excited. So um, this book is entitled The Mythical Origin of the Egyptian Temple by E.A.E. E. Raymond. Oh, you know what I've realized? I think I've spelled her name wrong. It's R-E-Y-M-O-N-D. I'll have to correct that. I totally did spell it incorrectly. Okay, so yeah, um, some dude on this ancient civilization show I was watching like recommended this book and it sounded juicy. So I went online and searched for it and um, I could find it nowhere to buy. <laughs> so then I started searching for um, where this book would be at all. Maybe I could rent it from somewhere. And lo and behold, thank goodness for the library. Um, there were a couple copies in Ohio, and one wasn't too far for me to drive and go and snag it. Whoa! Look at that. It's right here in my house. It's so cool. You can't even buy it, right? <laughs> okay, so The Mythical Origin of the Egyptian Temple by E.A.E. E. Raymond. All right. <clears throat> Let's do it. Hey, good to see you, KK. Good to see you, Dustin. Welcome in Paradox Fossil. Everyone, welcome. Preface. The greatest number of documents concerning the history of Egyptian temples that have come down to us and have been made available for further studies are, in the main, records commemorating various acts of foundation and all the good deeds which the Egyptians, Egyptian kings did on behalf of on behalf of their gods and temples. Very little, however, is known about the essential nature and condition of the Egyptian temple. Although archaeological and textual, textual sources abound, no coherent picture has ever been given of all the functions of the temple in the life of ancient Egypt. What the temples as an entity meant to the Egyptians and how they came to regard their temples in the course of the history remains as a subject for future studies. <clears throat> hey, Luca, welcome in. Good to see you again, dude. Scarcely any attention had given all right. Scarcely any attention had been given to documents from Greco-Roman times, in particular to the inscriptional treasures preserved on the walls of the temples in Upper Egypt. These documents are a rewarding source of study, for they throw new light on the characteristics of the Egyptian temple and permit us to gain a fairly clear idea of what the temple was for the Egyptians. And <clears throat> gain a fairly clear idea of what the temple was for the Egyptians and what its part in the history of the country. Balls, I'm struggling with that. I think I get the gist of it here, but let's try again. So these documents are a rewarding source of study, for they throw new light on the characteristics of the Egyptian temple and permit us to gain a fairly clear idea of what the temple was for the Egyptians and what was its part in the history of the country. These texts, so far as we are aware, have never been translated or commented upon, and despite their outstanding interest and value for the position of the temple in the ancient world in general, they seem to have entirely escaped the notice of scholars. We think that it is necessary to remedy this neglect and to attempt to trace the way of approach to the contents of the documentary sources from Greco-Roman times. Greco? Greco? <laughs> so I, Saturnian, good to see you, man. Welcome in. Awesome. -o. <clears throat> the history of the Egyptian temple, though not unknown in many respects, is still a fresh field, and each new step in this field throws new light on the part which the temple as an entity played in the life of ancient Egypt. Our study is only a starting point, a mere attempt to interpret Egyptian views on the beginnings of their temple. The background of this study was my PhD thesis at the University of Liverpool submitted in September 1960. Between the thesis, conferment of the degree, and the present book, only a short period of time has elapsed. Nevertheless, the work was subject to many modifications and rearrangements, which naturally added to its extent. Uh, 
In preparing this work for publication, I have retained the general form and organization into parts. I have made, of course, substantial changes in the exposition of facts and supplemented them with more evidence, which, of course, came to light after the thesis had been written. Many of the footnotes of the original version were expanded and subsequently incorporated in the main parts of the text. This necessitated some alteration in the order of chapters within the larger parts of the book. I cannot close these lines without expressing my gratitude for their patient endurance to all who, like martyrs, stood alongside the path of all the preliminary studies which led to this work, and finally to those who have assisted in the elaboration of this book. I wish to express my warmest thanks to my colleague, Dr. J. Gwynne Griffiths of University College, Swans Swansea? Swans Swansea? S-W-A-N-S-E-A for his kind assistance in the final preparations for publication. My deepest gratitude is to my parents, to my father in particular, whose endless patience and generosity permitted me to follow my academic pursuits wherever I chose. To my sorrow, pitiless fate destroyed sincere wishes. To my sorrow, pitiless fate destroyed sincere wishes. This writing is only a humble tribute to him, who departed from our midst. I also owe much to Sir James Mountford, Vice Chancellor of the University of Liverpool, and to the authorities of the University of Liverpool for all the faculties which they made available to me, to the trustees of the Liver, River, uh, Liver, Hume, Liver, uh, Lever, trustees of the Lever Home, H E V or no, L E V E R H U L M E, Leverholm Research Fund, for their kindness in awarding me a grant which enabled me to pursue research in the history of Greco Greco Roman Egypt, and also to write this book. Finally, I am grateful to the authorities of the University of Manchester for their help in arranging for the publication of this book, and to Manchester University Press for their care in publishing it. E A E Raymond. Liverpool, September 1960. Manchester, December 1961. <clears throat> okay, let's tuck that back. Abbreviations. A-E-O. Garnier. Ancient Egypt. Onomastica. A-E-O. Garnier. Oh, no. <laughs> so, wait. I, I Do I... Don't I have something I can use to reference this page multiple times? Boom. Okay, wait. Or wait, let's read it first. Okay. Um, ancient Egyptian onomastica. Onomastica. Therasia. Seek. Seek for seek for sight. Welcome in, everyone. Onomastica. Let's look it up. Onomastic. Okay. O N O M A S T I C A. Onomastica definition. Oh wow. In English, what is it? Spanish. Onomastico. Well, it's the same in in English. What? Okay, what does onomastico mean? Name day. Onomastico. Name day. Plural. Onomasticai. Onomasticai? Onomasticai. Wait. Um, name day. Like the day you're born? I don't know. Um, English tradition of onomastico. Collins Dictionary. Let's see what this says. Onomastico. Name day. Today's my name day. Like. Okay, well, what's a name day? Masculine noun, name day, onomastico. These examples, okay, wait. 
Hmm. Italian. <laughs> Onomastico definition <clears throat> in English. Name day. Okay, thank you. <laughs> a custom where Catholics named after a saint will celebrate their onomastico. Hey, the Italian enthusiast, thank you. What is onomastico? For many Italians, celebrating one's onomastico is just as special as celebrating one's birthday. And for some, it is even more special. Onomastico means name day in Italian. And in Italy, there is a custom where Catholics named after a saint will celebrate their onomastico on the same day as that saint's feast day. For example, my first name is Anthony, and just two days ago, on June 13, I celebrated my onomastico because on June 13th, St. Anthony's feast day is celebrated. Similar to birthdays, I received messages from my Italian friends stating, Bon, bon onomastico. B-U-O-N. Bon on Mastico. It is also customary to receive small gifts on your on Mastico. <laughs> on Mastico is celebrated more in southern Italy, as many northern Italians do not even consider their on, on, on Mastico as having significance, religious or otherwise. On Mastico is celebrated more in religious families due to its due to its Christian origins. That fly, all oh, but still. <laughs> um, onomastico tr tradition is an old tradition that was practiced with greater significance in prior generations. Wow, that's interesting. Onomastico. Michelle, good to see you. Awesome, welcome in. So ancient Egyptian onomastica yeah i don't know what to do about the interwebs right now plus like there's just like a lot of people around where i am right now using this internet <clears throat> i think that has something to do with it yeah happy valentine's day because it's valentine's day there's events going on okay so abbreviations <laughs> Lord, we'll have to timestamp. I'll have to timestamp when I actually start reading the book. Okay. APA, A P A W, Abhandlungen der Pre Preswischen Akademie der Wissenschaften, Berlin. <laughs> A S A E. Annales du service des antique, antiques, 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 the tildes on the E, or the ausente, antiques de el Egypt, Le Egypt, Cairo. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> okay, anyway. A W L B, Academie der Wissenschaften und Literatur. Literatur, Berlin. Oh, are these all going to be strewn throughout the book? Like a lot? Well, let's find out. Okay. Um, uh, Bifao, B-I-F-A-O. Bulletin de l'Institut Francais de Archaeologie Orientale Cairo. BJRL, Bulletin of John Ryland's Library, Manchester, CD, E. Chesonet. I apologize if I'm butchering this, y'all. E. Chesonet, Le Temple de Den Den Dendara. Dendara. I heard someone say that recently. Dendara, maybe. Dendara. D A W W, Deutsch Akademie de. Wissenschaften Denk Schriften Vienna E E Chassinet Le Temple de Edfu 
Edfu. JEA, Journal of Egyptian Archaeology, London. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to have to reference this. K.O. J. De Morgan, Com Ombo. K O M O M B O. M. E. What is this word? Because it's now on the third. Oh, it's the same person? Just in a different language, maybe? C D. E and M. E Chasana. Chasana. N A T. It's C H A S S I N A T. Le Mamisi de Afu. M D. Marriott Den Dendera. M M A F is Memoirs de la Mission Archaeologique Francaise du Caire, maybe Cairo. W B, which is Wharton Booch der Egyptian. Sprache and Zas Z A S Zeitschrift der a, a Egyptian Sprache. <laughs> well, that was something. Okay, so part one sources, <clears throat> chapter one. The Edfu documents on the history of the Egyptian temple. On the walls of Egyptian temples of the Greco-Roman period are inscribed, inscribed numerous ritual texts, among which occurs a series of texts that is found only in a very abbreviated form in certain of the pharaonic temples. Those texts make it possible to reconstruct a reasonably complete history of the building of each temple concerned and a picture of the layout of its rooms and halls and their ritual purpose and significance. The late, okay, that says one. Wow, these are big. Am I going to do that? So, yeah, there's a little, there's a one down here connected to that. And it says, little attention has been given to the history of the building and organization of the Egyptian temple. And then, Dumitian's Burkunden der Tempel Lagen von Dendera, 1865, and Bageshite des Dender Tempels, 1877, pages 1 through 13, are the first attempts at such a work. They were followed by Ehrman in Die Religion der Egypter and a bunch of these other books. Okay, so I'm not going to I'm not going to go into all of this language that I don't speak. Okay. But this is uh giving references. That's what all that is. I think some of it's um French, some of it's German, some of it's Dutch. <laughs> Holy moly. I know, right? <laughs> okay, so Ritual purpose and significance. The latest temples all contain such texts, but nowhere are they so numerous or so extensive as in the temple, <clears throat> as in the temple of Edfu, which for this reason must be regarded as our most important source. The Edfu documents include the great building texts, which are always found written in bold characters, very often in part in the characteristic decorative Ptolemaic script in broad bands on prominent architectural features, such as the exterior of the Naos, N, capital N-A-O-S, exterior of the Naos, or the inner and outer faces of the enclosure wall. Cool. These texts are primarily, though not exclusively, concerned with the history of the building of the Edfu Temple, and disclose a broad, generalized verbal picture of the temple, its rooms, and their dimensions. In addition to these general descriptions, each room or hall in the temple has its own individual building text, also engraved in conspicuous bands or on such prominent features as door jams. It's, hey, door jams spelled with a B. Its purpose being to give briefly the name, nature, ritual significance, and sometimes even the contents of decoration of the particular 
of the particular room. By conflating these greater and lesser building texts, it is possible to draw up an outline picture of the nature and significance of the temple as a whole. And using this knowledge as a foundation, it is possible to embark on a deeper study of the life in the temple and the significance and function of the historical temple. The series of texts mentioned is not only, or rather is not solely concerned with any exposition of facts about the historical temple, but occasionally hints at the existence of certain mythological events. The first, the first hint of the existence of these mythological circumstances is to be found in the building texts of the Naus, where the foundation, building, and bringing to life of the historical temple is described as happening in a mythical age. The historical temple is interpreted as the work of the gods themselves, and as an entity of a mythical nature. This short record seems to indicate a, a belief in a historical temple that was a direct continuation, projection, and reflection of a mythical temple that came into existence at the beginning of the world. The idea of a mythological situation that would seem to surround the existence of the historical temple can be supported by further evidence. I have found on many occasions that the Edfu temple was described by names of mythical shrines and sacred places. The use of these names can hardly be incidental, since they substitute the name of the temple of Horus, the the be, the Bededha, be Hmm. Horus the Bedatite. Bet There's an extra H in there. I think it might be silent. Hey, there might be Polish in there. <clears throat> the Betite. The Bed the Bedatite. The Bedatite. Horus the Bedatite. In such texts as the main building text or the morning hymns, which were recited at the opening of the daily life of the temple. This manner of describing the historical temple at Edfu was, in my view, based on even deeper reasons, and may eventually attest a belief in a relationship between the temple at Edfu and the sacred places of a mythical age. <laughs> this is cool. Okay, I wonder if this is cool enough for me to drink some now. I just saw my mom right before I went live. It was kind of maybe like destiny that I was having technical difficulties, because it was great to see her. And give her a kiss on Valentine's Day. Woo! It's still hot, but it's good. Missy, welcome in. Awesome. I hope you're having a great day. I am having a great day. I went on a whole adventure to a whole big town. And I got this book. <laughs> it's so cool. Yeah, I couldn't even find a copy of this book to buy, but the last copy of this book that I could find that did sell was for over 500 doll hairs, and they let me take it home with me. <laughs> Akron, I went to Akron, to the University of Akron. They had a copy in Ohio there. It was cool. I have a card there now. I'm a Patreon. <laughs> it's so cool. <laughs> oh, son of a gun. Okay, <clears throat> let me get my foot all tucked up in here. Okay, so this is juicy. Okay, so the sacred places of a mythical age. Much decisive evidence of the same idea is disclosed by the building text of the interface of the enclosure wall, where two mythological events in prim uh, primeval times, primeval, primeval, Events in primeval times are recorded in addition to the description of the actual temple. They appear to have a direct bearing on the origin of the temple of Horus, the Betadite, B, let's find out how to say it. <laughs> Betadite, Be Bedet Bedet let's find out how, how the interweb says we say it. Onomastico. Okay, so B E H B E T I T E Betatite Betatite 
Um, pronunciation. Yeah, that one. How to pronounce. Beta tight. <laughs> That's what she said. I don't know if you can hear it from there. Sometimes it, my mic picks up my um my uh sound but sometimes it don't beta tight beta tight okay i'm glad i looked that up okay great beta tight <laughs> hey angel i didn't see you come in welcome in awesome good stuff sending you the good vibes so beta tight. Okay, so they appear to have a direct bearing on the origin of the Temple of Horus, the beta tight. In the first record, we, re we read about the origin of a primeval resting place of the falcon. Okay, so yeah, all of those are references. A group of texts inscribed to the facade of the Sanctuary in the Temple of Horus at Edfu. Miscellanea, Georgi, George, Gre Gregori, Gregoriana. Okay. <clears throat> the Falcon, primeval domain. The other pictures of life. Oh, wow. That was just a comma. That wasn't the end of the sentence. I'm, I'm going again. They... Uh, <laughs> Third time's a charm. They appear to have a direct bearing on the origin of the Temple of Horus at Beta Tite. In the first record, we read about the origin of a primeval resting place of the falcon. The other pictures of the life in a primeval domain of the falcon. This building text ends with a description of the events believed to have led to the foundation of the solar temple. The importance of the mythical past in the life of the historical temple may be illustrated by a ritual episode represented in the third register of the north wall, or the west side, of the inner face of the enclosure. This scene shows Thoth, who is described as Thoth, twice great, lord of Eshmunin, sweet of tongue, efficacious of speech, oh, efficacious, efficacious of speech, the August Ibis, Ibis, who writes, for whose are a greater, whose are greater, for those who are greater than him, who issues commands to him, who came into being before him. He is depicted offering a sacred book to Horus, the Betatite, while uttering the words, I came unto thee, O my father, the Betatite. I am thy child who issued from thee. I bring thee the charter for magnifying. The, I bring thee the charter for magnifying thy domain from the reign of Tanen until the present day. Thou art the sacrificed God who came into being at the first occasion in whose name the temples are inscribed. Whoa. came unto thee. <clears throat> the same scene contains a spell which alludes to another mythological event and seems to imply the belief that these were the words of Ray, who said, Behold me. And Ray proclaimed, quote, Settle down beside me, and gladness is in the playlands of Jeba. The name of our Lord is Horus. So said the crew, end quote, end quote. Dang, I, I just, I wonder if this will be able to zoom in maybe for someone on a computer to see like what I'm working with here. There's, um, is that the right? No, this is the right one. Okay, how do I get light on this? Like this, like this, okay. Now, behold me and all this stuff in here. And then there's like in parentheses, NDM, like B, Mark, I don't know, W dash R, little C, G S P R W. I'm not sure what all that means.
Paylands, the Paylands of capital D J E B A. I just said Jebba. The Paylands of Jebba. The name of our Lord is Horus. So said the crew. So SNN book offered by Toth, because that was in parentheses back here. I bring thee the charter in parentheses SNN for magnifying in parentheses SWR thy domain, thy domain for the reign of Tannen until the present day. So then it says, the same scene contains a spell which alludes to another mythological events, event and seems to imply the belief that these were the words of Ray. The mention of the SNN book offered by Thoth to Horus, the Betatite, brings to mind a sacred book in memory of which is preserved in the building text of the enclosure of the Edfu Temple. Its title reads... The Sacred Book of the Temples. And then it has all those other <clears throat> characters that I don't know a lot of. It is certain that this book did not contain regulations of the temple ritual services or descriptions of the structural development of the Edfu Temple. The part of this document preserved at Edfu reveals that it includes lists of names of mythical shrines and sacred places. Each name listed is accompanied with a brief explanation of the mythological significance implicit in that particular name. We venture to suggest that this book might be a codification of the traditions and beliefs that surrounded sacred places of remote data or of remote date. These records might have been copied and rewritten at a later date with specific, or rather, with special reference to the historical temples. This evidence would seem to witness to the idea of a continuity and relationship between the actual historical temple and far distant sacred places, which the tradition, tradition regarded as being of a mythical nature. SNN, right? I'm not sure. Hey, this even has stuff like from back in the day, because, you know, this was published in the 60s and stuff. Wow. April 23rd. Cool. The University of Akron Library. Okay, um, let's get a sip. <clears throat> it is it's kind of okay with the aid of the clues and information provided by these inscriptions, it has been possible to isolate and identify a number of other texts which seem to be closely related to them. It has not hitherto been fully appreciated that there is at Edfu an extensive series of texts which give in considerable detail an account of the mythological origin of the temple and throw valuable light on the way in which the Egyptians looked on the temple and its origin. It is largely an unknown and untranslated group of texts that forms the center of this study. These texts can be found in various parts of the Edfu temple. The most important of them are a group of texts in the third, uppermost register of the east and west wall of the inner face of the enclosure wall. These are, in fact, cosmo, um, cosmo, cosmogonical, cosmogon, cosmogonical documents. Cosmogonical. Let's look it up. Cosmogonical. I like it. Pertaining to the branch of astronomy, dealing with the origin and history and structure and dynamics of the universe. It's like cosmogony. Yeah. Cosmogonical. Magonical? 
Okay, let's try for pronunciation. Cosmogony. Um, pronunciation. Yeah. Cosmogonical. McGonagall. Is this a Cosmogonical. Come on, let's get a different one. You're not human. Um, which is okay. I just mean, I want to know how humans say it. Mm, how to pronounce. Where's that one guy? I love that guy. <laughs> Cosmogonical. Cosmogonical. Really? Not cosmogonical? Cosmogonical. Cosmogonical. Okay. I'll try it that way. Mr. Hugh, Heather, welcome everyone. Awesome. -o. Cosmogonical. Cosmogonical? McGonagall. Cosmogonical. Okay, let's find that word. <clears throat> Um, it is, okay, it is highly probable that the first cosmogonical record is on the West Wall. Cool. And is connected with a scene of adoration of the sanctified God who came into being at the first occasion, which was italicized. This act of adoration was believed to have been performed in a primitive sacred place described as Jeba and Wetchset Nieder, which is depicted on the wall of the temple together with all the divine beings who were believed to have dwelt there. The second record, again on the west wall, is associated with a scene of bringing an oblation to the divine beetle and to the gods who are in his train. This relief is studied in all details in my article on the primitive Jeba. Okay, cool. So that was all in italics as well. In the left part of the scene, we find the king presenting an offering to the protective deities. On okay, The right part is occupied by another scene of adoration of the sanctified God who came into being at the beginning italicized. He is described as the great falcon of the primeval age. Am I saying that wrong? And is associated with ta, p, capital P-T-A-H. The third record is on the east wall and is added to a scene of elevating the choice pieces of meat. This scene of adoration resembles the scene linked with the second record. The fourth record is connected with one of the episodes of the foundation ritual, the stretching of the cord over the temple. The accompanying relief and ritual text describes the foundation of the great seat of Harakte by the king, Thoth, and Seshet. Seshet. Dang it, I should know how to say that one. S-E-S-H-A-T. On the right of the scene is represented the procession of the builder gods and seated figures of the Ogdoad. Ogdod? O-G-D-O-A-D. -O wow. So these are all... They're reliefs. They're hieroglyphs, dude. The fifth record is incorporated in a scene of adoration with, or of adoration, the great seat, 
and bears the title Adorning the Festival Hall. We find in the center of the scene the figures of Horus, the Betatite, Hathor, the Ta, or Hathor and Ta, seated in a kiosk and presented with the symbol HTS by the king. Beyond them, an assembly of gods is, present, is represented. In front of them, following the king, there is, a, there is depicted a procession of 30 gods. Two extracts from the same record are engraved on the front part of the pronouns. Nevertheless, taken together, these records appear to form a connected set of mythological narratives of which extracts and adapted versions are to be found in other parts of the Edfu temple and are incorporated in the ritual texts to be recited at the worship of the ancestor gods of the Edfu temple in, and, and in the scenes of offering the lotus. In addition, each of the main building texts contains, apart from the lists of mythological names, concise or modified versions of the cosmogonical narratives preserved in the scenes described above. Pearl, welcome in. Good to see you. It seems inherently probable that this rich repertory of various documents primarily formed parts of a single book that was called Specification of the Mounds of the Early Primeval Age. Although this book is mentioned only in the Edfu inscriptions, there are good reasons for supporting that this book was of general application and not a special work with restricted reference to the Edfu temple. It can be taken as certain that this book was different from the normal type of the temple service books, for its name does not occur in the list of the books kept in the library of the temple at Edfu. It was now most probably of another origin than these sacred scripts, scripts and did not belong to the group of temple service books described as the sacred books of Atum. At Edfu, the set of the Cos Magonical records is described as being of divine origin. The introduction to the first Edfu cosmo cosmogonical record discloses the tradition that the contents of these records were the words of the sages in italics. We are told that this sacred book was believed to be a copy of writings which Thoth made according to the words of the sages of Mewerit, which is capital M-E-H-W-E-R-E-T. There's people laughing outside. <laughs> mm. Oh, yeah. So good. I went with ginger peach. Oh, yeah, because when I was out with Dixie today, we stopped at this, um, it's like a meat market. It's like they, they have like baked goods and oh my gosh I got I got a whole like um mm, what do you call those things anyways I got a huge jar of peach jam oh my gosh I'm so excited about it I haven't tasted it yet but so I have ginger peach in here I'm like revving myself up for some pb and j later after this um a mason jar, a whole mason jar of it. <laughs> the lady recommended this one. She said it was her favorite. And I had already like eyeballed it. And I was like, oh man, because I've been on this PB and J kick. Okay. Yeah. I got to go get some more like whole grain bread and stuff. Okay. Okay. So, um, peach. <laughs> Um, the offering of the lotus. Okay, mentioned. Oh no. Oh yeah. Okay, so may wear may wear it. Okay, so 
We are told that the sacred, I'm reading that again. We are told that the sacred book was believed to be a copy of writings which Thoth made according to the words of the sages of may wear it. The use of the word, which is like, it's sort of like an I, and then it's like a backwards three and a T. The use of the word ist, I'll say, or mound, in the plural, suggests that this book included inter alia, lists of cultist places which were believed to have been founded before historical times. It can tentatively be suggested that in this context, the expression, the sacred mounds of the early primeval, primeval age, might have been used as a general name of the prehistoric cultist places of Egypt. And then let's see if I can't point out what this really looks like. I don't even know what language this is. Do you see it right there? Okay. It has been noticed on a close examination that the Edfu version of the sacred book combines in a continuous narrative two myths that may originally have been separate. The summarized versions of these mythological narratives incorporated in the building texts of the inner face of the enclosure wall make it evident and show as titles of the myths the sacred book of the early primeval age of gods and the coming of Re to his mansion of Misneth, which is MS-NHT. These two titles are unknown to the main sources. It may be suggested, therefore, that the main Edfu records listed above are to be divided into two groups, <clears throat> numbers one and two, and the end of number five, seem to preserve a substantial portion of the myth which may primarily have been included in the sacred book of the early primeval age of gods, which was concerned with the origin of the sacred domains and temples of the falcon. Numbers three and four are and the greater of and the greater part of number five appear to yield most probably a portion of the second myth described as the coming of Ray to his mansion of Misnit, in which the origin of the solar temples seems to have been explained. There is no argument that these titles were of a late date, or there is no argument that these titles were of a later date or were even the Edfu tradition. Their significance, however, seems to indicate that we have here two originally independent myths which might have been included in the sacred book of the specification of the sacred mounds at a later date. Therasia, welcome in. Good to see you. Hmm, that hair was tickling my nose. The analysis of the surviving part of the book, of the sacred book, shows that it was primarily concerned with the interpretation of the origin of sacred places of the falcon and those of the sun god, to which was added an account and exploration of various mythical events believed to have led to or preceded the foundation of the sacred domains of these two gods. This book seems also to include the interpretation of the origin of the temple of the falcon and that of the sun god. It also contains descriptions of the layout of some primitive temples which might eventually have evolved in the places in which these two gods were first worshipped. These descriptions and interpretations are detailed so that it is possible to trace the development of these temples and to reconstruct their physical appearance. All the cosmogonical records which are known from the Edfu tradition can hardly preserve the entire original version of the myths, and the Edfu texts may be regarded as mere summaries or epitomes of the more important parts of the complete myths. It is probable that we have preserved only a restricted number of extracts, extracts from which the Egyptian points of view were considered as vital. We incline to the opinion that this set of 
the ed food documents enables us to embark on a fresh field of study which may reasonably be described as the mythological history of the egyptian sacred places and their temples translations of and commentaries on the main sources of our study are not incorporated in the present work since a proper philological since a proper philological study of these texts would require a volume of great proportions and of high cost in view of the importance of these texts, however, it has been thought useful for the present to make available a detailed summary of the chief Edfu cosmogonical documents concerned. Wow. That was chapter one. Let's see how long chapter two is. Hey, someone left a thing in here. That's sweet. Shoot, right? I think, dang, I really want to keep reading, but maybe I should call it. It's already an hour almost. Cool. They have like little hieroglyphs in here, dude. <laughs> you see them? That is sweet. Dude. So chapter two, myth about the origin of the domains and the temple of the falcon. I'm going to call it right here. That was a lot to, oh man, it's so juicy, right? Wow. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to call this right here and then I'm going to go live once again next time on chapter two. <laughs> so juicy oh i didn't ever mark that page that's okay i can do it later so yeah happy valentine's day everyone and um i'm sending you the loves and the good vibes thank you Streamyard. thank you youtube thank you everyone here with me now later whenever you come across this and um yeah take care of yourselves out there Mwah. i'll see you next time thank you